So Peter said this of Paul. Now, Peter and Paul had to, I just think it's interesting, Paul had to correct Peter and oppose him to his face because he was, uh, um, he was doing something sinful. Paul talks about this in the book of Galatians. When Paul talked about Peter, Paul was talking about the way that he really had to get Peter back in line. But notice what Peter says about Paul. He says in, uh, this is uh, 2 Peter 3, just listen to this. Count the patience of our Lord as salvation, just as our beloved brother Paul also wrote to you. Um, our most loved brother is how Peter saw him. And he says, just as Paul, so count the patience of our Lord as salvation. Um, just as Paul also wrote to you according to the wisdom given him, as he does in all of his letters when he speaks in them of these matters. Now, there are some things in them that are hard to understand. Thank you, Peter, for saying that. Which the ignorant, so, so they're difficult to understand. Now, you just come at that and say, okay, when you come to something that's difficult to understand, what is going to be prerequisite for understanding it? Time, wisdom, grappling, wrestling, not, not being um, lazy or superficial or, you know, I'm just going to come at this thing and yeah, it's kind of what it's saying. No, they're difficult to understand, you know, like we've got our, our brother here just got finished with his engineering degree. I'm certain there were things in your studies that were difficult to understand. Mathematical equations and problems and things that you come at it and it's like you got to do some you got to spend some serious time working through these things in order to come out on the other end with a proper answer. How many millions of wrong answers are there when you come to a difficult equation? Endless. Endless. There's great care that has to be given to properly understand. And this is what Peter says. He says, there's some things that are hard to understand, which the ignorant and unstable twist. And, and the, you know, the stakes here are eternally higher than getting a math equation wrong. Because he says, they're, they twist them to their own destruction as they do the other scriptures. You therefore, beloved, knowing this beforehand, notice that. Take care that you are not carried away with the error of lawless people. So by virtue, so he's saying, it's like, it's like the Holy Spirit is telling us this morning, as you come to the writings of Paul, you need to know even before you start that they are hard to understand. Which I take to mean a surface level understanding isn't going to come out with the proper understanding. So you have to do a deep dive and you have to spend the time and put in the hours. So let me read to you the scripture this morning. Just sit there and listen and let the words of Jesus through the Apostle Paul come by way of this very deep and very profound theological argument. And just, just listen. And I'll, I'll read this and then we're going to talk about it. Therefore, just as sin came into the world through one man and death through sin... And so death spread to all men because all sinned. For sin indeed was in the world before the law was given, but sin isn't counted where there's no law. Yet death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over those whose sinning wasn't like the transgression of Adam, who was a type of the one to come. But the free gift is not like the trespass. For if many died through one man's trespass, much more have the grace of God and the free gift by the grace of that one man, Jesus Christ, abounded for many. And the free gift isn't like the result of that one man's sin. For the judgment following one trespass brought condemnation, but the free gift following many trespasses brought justification. For if because of one man's trespass, death reigned through that one man, much more will those who receive the abundance of grace and the free gift of righteousness reign in life through the one man, Jesus Christ. Therefore, as one trespass led to condemnation for all men, so one act of righteousness leads to justification and life for all men. For as by the one man's disobedience, the many were made sinners, 
so by the one man's obedience, the many will be made righteous. Now the law came in order to increase the trespass. But where sin increased, grace abounded all the more, so that as sin reigned in death, grace also might reign through righteousness, leading to eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Everything prior to this point, let's, let's put this in context before we kind of get into this. That's how I feel. <laughs> That's, that was the base. That was my prayer like 40 times this week back there. <laughs> uh, and, and I do also, I ask that you please pray for me to understand and to have wisdom. Um, I do not know near everything. And there's so much to learn. And this is, I, I do, I welcome your prayers, please. Because we're not done with this and I'm not done studying it yet. But the context leading into this, remember the context going into this is, you know, Paul's built this big case to say nobody is righteous. Nobody in the world is righteous. Uh, because everybody was under law, everybody. It was the Jews were under the law of Moses, the Gentiles were under the law of nature. Everybody sinned against it. Therefore, none is righteous, not even one. But then he said, but now the righteousness of God has been manifested apart from the law. Um, the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ, whom God put forward as a propitiation to be received by his blood. And so then he's like, so at the end of chapter 3, where's the boasting? Is there any room for boasting before God when, you're, when the only reason you stand right and proper before God is because of something Jesus did and not because of something you did, what you did deserved death? And then in chapter 4, he, he gets into what is the one thing God does expect of you? What is it? Faith. Thank you. Faith. And then in chapter 5, he says, therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God. You want to, that's how you went from, from hostility and an enemy of God to being at peace with God was by way of faith. And then he, he just spelled out all of the good things we have in Jesus Christ. And then last week, we really looked at what was, you remember we looked at how amazing it really is. Paul says, you all won't even die except rarely for a righteous person. But Jesus gave his life for us while we were still enemies, while we were sick, while we were hostile, while we were um, living in sin. And, you know, that's, that's what he said. He says, Do you, have you thought and considered how amazing it is that Jesus gave his life for you while, he, while you were still an enemy? And the whole book has been pointing to Jesus as the means to salvation and righteousness. And so then he starts by building this case in, uh, in verse 12. He says, therefore... At just as sin came into the world through one man and death through sin, and so death spread to all because all sinned. Now, let me ask you, did Paul stop his chain of thought? Did, yes, he did. This is, this is called like, in, in literature, it's called an anakalathon. You don't have to memorize that. This is when you're, you, you say something like, um, I can't believe Christmas, I haven't even bought all of my gifts yet. Well, what was I going to say about Christmas? It's almost here. Now, you put that together because I stopped and then I got to what I'm, this other thing. That's kind of what Paul is doing. He stops and he's going to pick up down somewhere around verse 18 with what he was actually saying, because you would expect verse 12 to say, just as sin came into the world through one man and death through sin, so righteousness came into the world through one man and life through righteousness. But Paul is expecting that to kind of be understood, but something derails him. He gets off on this idea, this other thing that he needs to stop and talk about, namely a little bit more about this one man who is Adam. That's kind of what derails him. And he's going to spend some time now talking about Adam. And uh, it's a very, Im very important subject. Now, what does he say about Adam? He says, look at the end of verse 14. 
He said, well, just all of verse 14. Death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over those whose sinning wasn't like the transgression of Adam. And then he says, who was a type of the one to come. What does that mean that he was a type of the one who was to come? Okay. Now, notice what he doesn't, notice the terminology Paul gives here. He doesn't say Adam was a type of Christ. He doesn't say Adam was a type of Lord. He doesn't say he was a type of Savior. Now, we know who the one to come is whom? Jesus. Right? Uh, and he's going to talk about all, that all through the text. But, but Paul doesn't want us associating Adam with any of the Christ, Savior, Lord stuff that he could have said of Jesus. He just says he's a type of the one to come. You know, what he means by this, now, now you're right, Will, that word means basically, very basically, like a model and um, some kind of an imprint of that. So that, But what does he mean by saying that Adam was a type of the one to come? I think what he means is that there are some very huge, monumental, in fact, similarities between Adam and Jesus. Um, despite the fact that those similarities are also polar opposites. You can, you can have somebody that, that is so much like somebody else while the particulars are polar opposites of one another. Over in uh, 1 Corinthians 15, Paul refers to um, Adam as the first man and Jesus as the last Adam. So there was the first Adam and then the last Adam. Adam being a Hebrew word that just means man. Adam was this um, first. Jesus is the final decisive man. And the similarities between them, Adam brought something into the world that would forever change the relationship of mankind with God. In the same way, Jesus brought something into the world that would forever change the relationship of mankind with God. Adam brought a destination that every man would work toward, and Jesus brought a destination that every man should work toward. Adam served as an exemplar, literally, of one way to live, and Jesus served as an exemplar of another way to live. Adam led, as an exemplar, countless men and women. And Jesus, as king, as Christ, leads countless men and women. So there are some profound similarities between the two of these men, between Adam and Jesus. This is what Paul means to say, is that Adam was a type of the one to come. There are major similarities. But a lot of the time in this text, he spends contrasting really where the differences are. The main point of the text, and I don't know how many are filling out the bulletin, but the main point of this text is to contrast the fruit of Adam with the fruit of Jesus Christ. The, the main point of the text is to say, as you look out over your life, there are only two men all in the ultimate sense that you can follow. You can follow in the footsteps of your father, Adam who is the father of all mankind. All mankind came from him. Or you can follow Jesus Christ. That's, that's the main point of this text. Now, there are a lot of difficulties within it, but if you back out and you just look at what is Paul saying, he's saying, let's compare these two. And here are some comparisons that he makes. Adam brings sin into the world, and Jesus brings a gift into the world. Now, sin, verse 12, just as sin came into the world through one man, that's what he brought, and death through sin. So Adam brought sin into the world. Now, notice how he contrasts that. Verse 15, 
But the free gift is not like what Adam brought. For if many died through one man's trespass, much more have the grace of God and the free gift by the grace of that one man Jesus abounded for many. So the first contrast that he wants to make is that Adam brings into the world something, namely sin, and Jesus brings something into the world, namely a free gift that he uses all through the text. Look at verse 16. The free gift isn't like the result of that one man's sin. For the judgment following one trespass brought condemnation, but the free gift following many trespasses brought justification. So how was Adam a type of the one to come? Adam brought something into the world that would change man. And Jesus brought something into the world that would change everything also. What else does Adam bring? Adam brings condemnation. And Jesus brings justification. Verse 16, the judgment following one trespass brought condemnation. But the free gift following many trespasses brought justification. Verse 18, therefore, as one trespass led to condemnation for all men, so one act of righteousness leads to justification for all men. Adam brings condemnation into the world, which is that we would stand before the God of the universe condemned. Jesus brings justification into the world so that we would stand before God justified and righteous and not condemned. Adam brings death. Jesus brings life. For if because of one man's trespass, death reigned through that one man, much more will those who receive the abundance of grace and the free gift of righteousness reign in life through the one man, Jesus Christ. That was verse 17. Look at verse 18. So one act of righteousness leads to justification and life for all men. Verse 21. As sin reigned in death, that's what Adam brought, grace also might reign through righteousness leading to eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Do you see the point that Paul's making between these verses? It's to say, stop and consider the two potential exemplars for your life and for how you could live and for what you could go forth and do and and put them side by side and look and say, would it, was there anybody in the world that seeing them framed in these terms would say, I want to follow Adam? Because, you know, what did Adam bring? He brought sin and condemnation and death. And, that, and in that way, he was a type of the one who was to come because he would bring these things that would really lead everybody down a certain path. But Jesus would bring a gift, namely justification and righteousness so that you would have eternal life before God. Which of those two, if you frame it like that, would you want to follow? I, I mean, it is, it is a, it's an absolute no-brainer. And the thing that, that astounds me is that right now, as you know, and this isn't just right now, this is really always the case, is that the thing that we hate the most in the world, the thing we dread above all other dreads, the, the fear that would rise to the top of every chart, the fear out of which probably every other fear finds its context and its bearings, namely death, the thing that we are working around the clock as a society to stop and to prolong and to bandage is the thing that is the result of the other thing that we are marching through the streets right now, boastfully parading ourselves about as a society in June. Which, which is just you know, Pride Month, which is just a, it's just a, 
you know, you can't set it off as though it's its own. I mean, it is kind of its own thing, but the, it's just an outworking of all of this. It's the thing we hate the most is the thing that we love, is, is the thing that the thing we love the most brings. Most convoluted sentence I've ever given in a sermon. The thing we hate the most, namely death, is the result of the thing we fancy the most. That's better. Isn't that, isn't that it? I mean, isn't that what we, we don't want death. And, and, but we, so we go through our whole lives, you know, as a society that's, that's got all these technological advances and medical equipment and, and know-how um, medically and internal, internal medicine and, you know, the ability that we have is profound, but it's just a bandage that, that we know, even as people, it can't ultimately fix. There's nothing that we can do to fix this thing we hate the most. But we try to cover it up while, while doing the very thing that brought it. Um, now, that's where we're going to stop. I have another several pages for this sermon that uh, I obviously didn't get to. I was going to get into this morning, and I'm glad I have another week, to be honest. I'll put more thought into this, and I'll develop this even more. I was going to get into the nature of sin and the basis of sin and where it comes from and what it is and um, how Adam is involved in it and what that means, and original sin and imputed sin and all of that. And, uh, but we're going to get into that next week. But um, I suppose it's good that this week the only thing that we really did was to look at the text broadly, which is going to help us as we look at it narrowly, and to say... Paul is contrasting in a very profound way two very different men, Adam and Christ. And this morning, which of these two do you want to follow? Which of these two will you follow? Who will you draw after? Whose behaviors will you replicate? Because Paul says, if you follow Adam, look at what comes of it your condemnation before God, and ultimately your death. And, and not only death physically, but eternal death. But look at what Christ brought into the world. This is the gospel. This is what we bring before the world. As the world is dying and suffering and dealing with disease and heartache and hurt, and, and you know, they're lost in their sins and all of that, we have the remedy, which is the gospel of Jesus. Look at what he brings. So, uh, I'm going to stop there this morning and um, just ask that we rest on that idea. And you can go forward this week and read through this passage and grapple with it and pray over it. And uh, we'll pick up here next week. Well, let's stand and sing.